Hello and welcome to 10 Python tips and tricks. Let's get started with the first one. Okay, let's say you want to assign some values to some variables. For example, you want to store names. So name one is Anna, name two is Joe, name three is Karen. Three lines of code for that, right? But you can achieve that by just using one line of code with the following syntax. You're just comma separating the variable names and then assign the names in the right order. So name one is Anna, comma separated, name two is Joe, comma separated, and then name three is Karen. It's also working in just one line of code, as you see here. So this is the first tip. Very useful and very convenient. The next one is about getting multiple variables from a function using tuple decomposition. First, let's take a look at tuple decomposition. Let's define a tuple here, and we are just providing some names. So Anna, Joe, and Karen. Let's print that out, and as you see, we have a tuple here containing those names. To assign those names to variables, we can just use name1, name2, name3, comma separated, and then assign that to this tuple. And as a result, we are getting Anna as name1, Joe as name2, and Karen as name3. This concept can be used to get multiple variables from a function. So let's get rid of that and let us define a function here. We're just using no arguments at all and we're just defining some variables here. So x is 1, y is 2, and z is 3. Now we are returning those variables. So that is x, y, and z, comma separated. If we are calling this function now, we are getting a tuple containing those values for x, y, and z. And to get those values now, we can just use again tuple decomposition. So we are just using x, comma, y, comma, z, and assign that to this function, which has an output of this tuple. So if we are doing that, we have x as 1, y as 2, and z as 3. Very helpful if you want to get locally defined variables on the global defined area. The next one is about using the DIR and help function. The DIR function is providing you the methods and properties of a certain object, and the help function is providing you some more detailed information. Let's take an example. Let's say I want to import pandas and get an overview of what pandas can do. I can use the DIR function for that. So I'm getting some methods and properties here. For example, the data frame, or index, or what else do you know? The read CSV function to read out CSV files. You know, so you are getting an overview of what pandas can do. Pivot tables, for example, plotting. So a pretty nice thing to get an overview of a certain library. If I want to have some more detailed information, I could use the help function. So let's say I want to find out stuff about the read CSV function. So I can just use pandas.read CSV and then I'm just using the help function for that. And now I'm getting more detailed information of what I can do with that, right? So as you see, read CSV, the arguments which you can provide for that, read a comma-separated values file into data frame as the description for that, and so on. So you can use those functions in combination to really efficiently work yourself through new libraries. So that is actually a pretty cool thing in my opinion. You can also use this DR and help function on your own defined classes. So if you have no idea what I'm doing right now, don't worry about it. Just as an information, if you are into defining own classes, you can use that to get an overview of what you have actually defined inside this class. So let's just define a very simple class, algorithms. We are just providing some methods for this class. So let's take example one. We're just using an empty function here. And then example two, we're using another empty function. And if I'm using the DIR function now on my own class, as you see, I'm getting example 1 and 2 as the methods of my own defined class. Let's take a look at swapping variables. Let's say A is 4 and B is 2. Now, I want to swap those variables, meaning that A is 2 and B is 4. I can achieve that with the hard way using a help variable. So I'm just assigning A to Z, so Z is 4. Now. I'm using A as B and have stored the value of B in A. So A is 2 and I've achieved the first step. 
The second step would be to use b equals to z and now b is 4. So I have achieved what I wanted to achieve with the whole pane. I can achieve that all with one line of code. So let's get rid of that and let's assign those values new. So a is 4 and b is 2. And I can just use a comma b equals to b comma a and I've achieved what I wanted to achieve, swapping the values for a and b. Very useful and also works with more than two variables, of course. The next one is about creating dictionaries with keyword arguments. Therefore, we are defining a function, which I'm just calling creator, using two stars as an argument and x. In the most cases, this is named quarks, but I'm using x for convenience here. So I'm returning x, and with this function, I can easily create dictionaries. So let's say you want to create a dictionary where you want to store the amount of money some friends owe you. We're just calling this function and name those people. So Wins is owing you 10 bucks, Sarah is owing you 30 bucks, Lara 20 bucks. And if we're executing that, we have just created a dictionary. Pretty fast, pretty easy, right? Now we can store that, of course. We need that for the next tip. So I'm just creating two dictionaries here. Let's take that dict one, and we're using this one here, and that dict two. We're using some other names. Let's take Joe again. Let's take Karen, and well, Martin. What like thirty-five? So let's print that out again. So we have two, created two dictionaries containing the amount of money people owe you. Let's take a look at merging dictionaries with dot .items and the or operator. So how is dot .items working? We are just using the that dict one, use the items function, and we are getting the value pairs as you see here. So we are just getting the key and the stored value. And we can use that to merge those two dictionaries. So if I'm using the or operator here and just take that dict two dot items, I'm just getting every value pairs in one. Now, how can I get a dictionary out of that by just using the dictionary function in front of that? So if I'm doing that like this, you see I'm getting a dictionary with those two dictionaries merged. I think that's a pretty nice and very useful feature if you if you have like a couple of dictionaries and you just want to store all ways in one. Next one is from module import star. Can save you a lot of typing, but should also be used with some cautiousness. Let's take an example to understand this. So we are importing the math module, which is just a module containing mathematical functions. So if I want to work with this module, I have to call it and then a certain mathematical function like the square root function. So I'm using that on 16 for example and I'm getting a 4. If I'm just using this function without calling the math module, I would get an error as this function is not defined. Now to avoid that, I can just use from math import square root. And now the square root function is defined. So if I'm using that, I'm getting the 4 again. But I just imported the square root function and not every other function. For example, let's take p. If I'm calling p here, I'm getting an error again. So I have to use again math.p and I'm getting p. Well, to get every single function from this math module, I'm just using from math import star. And now p is defined. Or let's take another example. We are taking the Euler's number and we're getting the Euler's number here. So we have imported every single function from this math module. This is, by the way, also working for more common packages like, for, for example, NumPy. So if I'm taking from NumPy import star, and like what's the most common NumPy thing, like arrays. So you would have used np.array here, and you, you could just use array and then do something like this and this is working right so you don't have to use np in front of that anymore as you've imported star from numpy and every single function from numpy 
is imported. As said in the beginning, using this is not without any difficulties, so the code readability is suffering by using that, and also the probability of overwriting variables by doing that is pretty high. So be careful using that, but it sometimes it's actually pretty useful. The next one is about anonymous or lambda functions. I already covered that in a full video, so be kindly invited to check that out, but I'm covering that in a nutshell here. Therefore, let's define a normal function first. And this function is just adding two numbers. So we are defining that as addition, provide two parameters of this function, and we are returning the sum of those two parameters. So if we are calling this function with providing two fives, we are getting a 10 as 5 plus 5 is 10. Now we could also use a lambda function to do that. And that is just, let's just define addition lamb here. We are using lambda x, y as the parameters of this lambda function, and then x plus y. So if we are calling this function by addition lamb and provide 5 and 5, let's just use the same parameters as above here, we are getting a 10 as well. So this is working in the same way as this function. Anonymous, this has no name, and again, one line of code instead of two. Very useful, very nice, but if you are defining like complex functions, maybe the traditional way is the better choice. Next one is about list comprehension, which enables you to create lists in a very efficient way. Let's say we want to have a list containing elements from 1 to 10. We can achieve that by using list comprehension. So we are using square brackets here, then define i for i in range 1 to 11. And if we're executing that, we are getting this list containing elements from 1 to 10. So how is this working? This i is the iterator starting at 1, and then iteratively we are adding those elements to this list. Now let's just sort this list to list 1 here and use list comprehension to filter this list. So let's print it out again. And now let's say we want to only have those numbers which are, let's start with even numbers, even numbers. We can use again list comprehension. So we are just using squared brackets again then i for i in list 1, which is this list here, and then if i, and then I'm using the modular operator here, and just say if the remainder of the division is 0, we got those even numbers here. So if we're executing that, as you see, we are just getting the even numbers out of this list. So on the other hand, let's do the same thing for the odd numbers. So I'm just using i for i in list 1 if i modulo 2 is not 0 and then we are getting the odd numbers out of this list. So as you see list comprehension many many use cases. Let's do one more example. Let's say you want to create a shopping list with individual defined items. So let's just define a shopping list here and now we're using list comprehension and use the input function say which item do do you want to add for i in range and let's just take three items here could be more of course and now you're being asked which item do you want to add so let's start with snacks apples bananas and now if we are printing out this list shopping list we are getting a list containing those individual defined items so just another use case for doing that Last one is about the enumerate function, which is adding a counter to an iterable. Let's take an example for that. Let's say we want to print out those elements in list 1 and also adding a counter to those elements. We can achieve that by defining a for loop for, and let's name it counter and element in enumerate and then take the list as an argument and then we're just printing out both the counter and the element. And as you see here, on the right hand side, we got those elements and on the left hand side, we have a counter starting from 0 to 4. Maybe this is somehow confusing with numbers, so let's do that again for those names. So we're just amending list 2 here and using the exact same syntax. And as you see, we're getting the names and the position starting at 0 and ending at 2 here. Okay, this counter is by default starting at 0, but there might be use cases where this counter should start at, let's say, 100. 
And you can amend that by just using a comma here inside the arguments of this enumerate function and provide 100 here. And this counter is starting at 100. So let's execute that. And as you see, this counter starting at 100 starts to count with each element. That's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. If this was helpful, consider liking and subscribing this channel. I thank you very much in advance and I'm looking forward to seeing the upcoming videos. See you next time. Bye bye.